Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session three of China Market Entry 2022, To Go or Not To Go. Um, for those of that have joined live today, uh, you have obviously seen us on Monday and Tuesday going through all the points about the um, importance of data, understanding your market share, your value proposition, your competitors, moving on to the structures that are available in China, the financial resources that are needed to get into market and how to formulate those calculations. And today we are talking about a very big topic, which is people. Um, before we start though, again, just a couple of slides um, on how the webinar works, uh, just very quickly, because most of you will know this. We're here to educate, again, use this time wisely. There's the chat box. There is no dumb question when we're talking about China. So please do ask any question or, or place any comment that pops in your mind and we will get to it at the Q&A, first come first serve principle. Um, we are recording today's session. Presentation will not be distributed, but you will get a link to the, uh, to the webinar recording. Uh, we are using Zoom meeting. Manfred is co-host. If anything happens on either of our sides, it will take a couple of minutes to reboot. Um, we've got a very interesting format of today's presentation, which I think will provide a lot of added value to everybody, something a little bit different we've never done before. Um, so again, if you run into any issues, log off, log back in, and hopefully it'll work. Just know we are recording, so you can see the recording later on. Um, and apologies if anybody gets frustrated with the technical side, um, we can't help you as we are presenting. Um, I know a lot of people are ready that are on here, but for those that are watching this on replay that are not able to come in live, please do let us know your background. Are you newbies? Are you startups? You can write them in the YouTube comments section um, or email Manfred and I. You know, we, we, we have a very clear picture of everybody that's on today, but for those that are watching this on replay because you're in a different time zone, do, do interact with us, even if it is virtually and not live. Um, what we are covering this week, again, this is just a quick recap. So on Monday, we were talking about the importance of data and being very specific on the data that we have today and the data that we need to still acquire in order to make decisions on how to approach the Chinese market. Yesterday, we were looking at the various business models that can be applied in China. And although there was no magic number revealed, how to calculate the financial resources that are needed to get into China. Today, we're talking about an empowering ecosystem of people. And tomorrow is a live Q&A, a mastermind with those who are willing to come on live and share what their three action points will be for the next 90 days following these three sessions. Um, the idea of tomorrow's session is truly a brainstorming. It's going back and forth. It's you validating what your next three action points will be with Manfred and I, all right? And just to highlight, if you guys are interested in doing a one-to-one -one with both Manfred and I, we still have one spot left for the quick strategy session. And I just wanna emphasize, normally we do charge for these quick strategy stretch sessions. It is 90 minutes. We're offering these three slots, two are already taken free of charge. They normally run at 600 euros. Um, so we do have one slot available um, and it's whoever is approaching us first for that slot um, who will want it. Um, how, what are we covering today? So I did want to go through this slide. Just, just one thing oh. shortly, Christina, before ahead, running friend. into that one, I just wanted to kind of reiterate on, on, on tomorrow and the whole idea for, for this week. It's, I hope that some of you had a chance to take down some notes, create some stuff. I know obviously always that sharing ideas, ways forwards, maybe also doubts with others is not easy. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, that will be a journey for the next couple of years if you really engage in it. Christina will have a couple of slides on that one later on, but um, it's only that path really that makes us forward. So I'm trying to say, don't skip tomorrow. Do come on tomorrow. Do, you know, say, do use that time to either ask Christina, myself, or the other people who are here in terms of like, what do you think about that? You know, could that work? Um, that is the, the, the best sort of thing to build your cohort, to build your peer group and to move forward with, with them um, even way beyond this, this webinar. That's what I've done in all my 
uh, many, many live workshops that I did. And that, that's something that works extremely well. So, you know, I'm, I'm really looking to forward to tomorrow. But before that, Christina, please move ahead for today. Thank you. So Manfred and I have a different way of approaching today's session. Manfred and I, although we are both in the service sector, we have, um, as managing directors, general managers, founders of our own companies, have different approaches, obviously, on how we see who the key people are in our own organizations. Um, Manfred and I, we do a lot of brainstorming on how we can elevate each other's businesses. Um, and we do this type of masterminding every couple of weeks, uh, again, to push each other to get the ball rolling. So what we wanted to do for this today's session is we've listed this, these five questions um, in the introduction blurb to this session. And we've each created a presentation based on our view of these, each of these questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each question, I'll present on it. Manfred will then present and share his slides. And um, what we've noticed is actually that uh, hopefully you will get a complete picture <laughs> because we've answered them very differently. You will get a complete picture of um, all the options that are available and what you can take as the next steps when evaluating who you think will be the key people, where they should be located, how you should employ them, what is your budget for employing them, and ultimately what could potentially be certain roadblocks or obstacles that come along the way. And you know, um, don't 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 be scared by maybe certain contradictions that are there or by by different yeah. points of views. Treat it as a buffet, you know, pick the things that you like, pick the things that you think make sense on, on your end. Um, I, I subscribe to the philosophy that, you know, even with all the experience we're trying to put on the table, it's, it's only really you who knows what, what works on your end, what makes sense, what kind of can be supported from the financial reality and all these sort of things. So, you know, um, it's a buffet. Exactly. Um, again, I, everyone that's coming on live right now knows us, but just again, for the YouTube uh, viewers, um, I'm Christina Kola Kaluccia. I'm head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Um, I've got over 17 years of experience in China with corporate compliance and corporate services, meaning that I've got a lot of administrative experience uh, running and administering companies in China as well as in Hong Kong. Um, I'm a big believer in standard operating procedures and processes. And China has matured itself in this area of administration where you can create SOPs and processes to a lot of the administrative functions that run within your organization. Um, and having these processes in place is a um, very solid foundation for the future growth of your organization in China. So subscribe to our YouTube channel because a lot of our webinars are up there, or you can also go to our web website to get more information. And if you're interested in getting a copy of our ebook, we've got um, an ebook that I wrote at the end of 2020 about the 10 biggest mistakes companies make in China. Again, this is from my perspective and my opinions on that. And if you want a copy, you can just email me at Christina at woodburnglobal.com and you can get a free, free version of this, this ebook. Manfred, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, my name is Manfred. Um, I've got a from a time perspective, similar story to Christina, I entered China back in 2003, um, survived the first wave of SARS in northeastern China at minus 35 degrees, and then went on to Beijing and, and Shanghai, the warmer and the cozier regions, doing project management um, with sizes of up to uh, uh, close to 100 million euros. And uh, yeah, well, then later on, we went into recruitment, and that's what we're doing these days for our uh, clients mainly in China, but more and more so globally. And uh, that's what we are excited and, and thrilled about. So if anybody out there is having a recruitment need or is having a Chinese entity that's not performing or wanting to start one, reach out to me, um, go to our homepage um, and uh, let's get the ball rolling to, to get started. Christina, let's move into it. So today we're talking about an empowering ecosystem of people, and I cannot emphasize this more. This is a topic that is close to my heart, predominantly because I left China due to COVID and have never been happier with the team that I have on the ground. And by team, it's not only my in-house employees, 
It is also the third parties that help me to scale up and grow my business. Um, with border controls, quarantine regulations, visa regulations, and all of this that is going on to get in and out of China, um, it's not something I will be doing. I've already done 21 days of quarantine in Hong Kong. I don't plan on doing that in China. So I am more and more reliant on this ecosystem that I have developed over the years to support not only my business, but the business of my clients. Um, and, and so that is what we're talking about today. And this is actually Manfred's day-to-day -day business. It is helping people find the right, um, uh, the, not the right, the key individuals that can really support and both the key and the right, Christina. It's both. both. <laughs> and, and grow the business in China. Um, knowledge is power in China. And the question obviously is, where are you going to gain that knowledge? You're going to gain it from third parties or from people that you are going to hire. Knowledge is the basis of doing business in China. Um, and obviously, you know, you have to continuously educate yourself on on many different aspects, whether it's legal, finance, um, employment, labor law regulations, simply understanding how to, to create a, an efficient trade flow, an efficient supply chain to be able to scale up your business in China. And because the market is so quick and swift, we have to make decisions swiftly. We cannot wait for things to roll. So we need to have people on the ground that can support us, that can guide us in making the appropriate decisions and also giving us the knowledge we need. So building this ecosystem is, is vital. It, it is up on that priority list of getting into the Chinese market. Um, now, before we start into the questions, I just wanted to highlight how can you meet people with the border controls that are currently existing, right? Many of you might feel Oh, this is impossible. How do you meet or connect with individuals that are in China and we're in the UK, in the US, in Germany, wherever it might be? So I've provided a list here in terms of where you can start, right? This is just a starting point. Now, there are lawyers, there are corporate service providers, there are headhunters, there are PR agencies who all provide free information on China whether it's through e-newsletters, whether it's through webinars, like what we're doing this week, which is complimentary and free, whether it's through informational sessions, um, they can give you plenty of information. Now you can subscribe to newsletters. You can receive these newsletters. The question is, are you reading them? Are you actually looking at the up-to-date information that is being generated by these providers? What I would like everybody to do as an action plan is um, think about two to three different service providers that you would like to get connected to and subscribe to them and start reading that content because that's the number way of getting information. The next is using chambers of commerce. So, um, you know, if you are in the UK, there is the China Britain Business Council, which is actually point four, but locally in China, you've got the BritCham, the British Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai and Beijing, and I think they've got I don't even want to make up a number now, but they've got over five different locations. You've got the German Chamber of Commerce, the AHK. You've got the Canadian Chamber, the American Chamber. Almost every country has its either trade commission or chamber of commerce, where you can also subscribe to their newsletters. You can also join free webinars. Um, and again, get information from people on the ground and get connected with then people who are members there. Like I said, you also have the China Country Association. So in the UK, you've got the China Britain Business Council. In Germany, there are three different associations. You've got the Hino Forum Bayern, the Ostasiatische Verein, and the Deutsche Chinesische Vereinigung. In the US, you've got the US China Business Council. Almost every jurisdiction will have their China associations as well, where you can subscribe, get information, get networked, speak to people, um, and learn more about the market. And just to Christina, if I may add, yes, um, two short things here on on, on this one. Okay. Um, I think once you're in there, you know, everybody has their 
certain people they prefer, certain ways, certain certain characters, characteristics, small, large. Uh, one people show is a huge different. However, once you find a person where it fits, once you find you know one piece of the puzzle, try and get referrals from them. Um, just kind of speaking of my own experience, uh, you can reach out to me, you know, out of the blue. You can reach out to me um, from the internet. However, if, for example, you are a client of Christina and you're coming through that channel, just of a, you know, a personal human habit, I will treat you differently. Um, it's just what it is, you know, and China is very much Guanxi based. It's very much contact based, you know. If you are within a certain community, it's, it, it's natural, you know, to, to take care of these people. And if there is a cross referral, then, you know, you want to, you, you don't want to disappoint your existing client or something along those lines or partner, friend, whatever. Um, so, you know, yeah. just, just going through that way, um, try it. You'll, you'll see the difference. Exactly. The other thing is trade shows. Now, I've gotten a lot of emails um, where people have said, um, I've, China, I've canceled China. China is not even in my expansion list anymore because I can't join the trade shows that are happening in China. Well, there are still these virtual trade shows. And by all means, I'm not saying that they are better or worse than doing it live and physically going to China and having trade shows there. But there is still an opportunity to network and meet up with people that are on these virtual trade show, con trade show um, platforms. I did an event at the end of last year with the Hong Kong Trade Development Council that organizes almost all trade shows in Hong Kong. And they were showing me how they do these virtual trade shows and how they put so much emphasis into the B2B networking aspect. It's phenomenal. And you can still meet really interesting people um, through this techno technological platform, don't ask me anything about IT, but through these technological platforms, it is still a way of getting the ball rolling. Don't eliminate, eliminate something completely, even though it's not the best of the best. We are in a pandemic and we're trying to do the best we can as we progress. Um, so I just want to highlight that on the virtual trade shows aspect. LinkedIn still exists in China and people underestimate that. You can still get linked up with people that are based in China through the LinkedIn channels. And for some reason, I think there are a lot of people who think LinkedIn is blocked in China. So far, it is not. There are rumors that might happen, it, but it is still an avenue. It, 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 it is already very, very limited uh, to use, Christina. So it kind of just as a later, latest update on that one. Uh, but I do agree that it's still, you know, very much a, a, an easy way to see. And again, to find content, uh, to find people who are speaking on, on, on certain things. Right. The other is WeChat. If you don't have WeChat, get WeChat. You don't. Now, the, the, the difficulty with getting WeChat is you do need somebody to authorize it and you need that person to be next to you because they have to bar scan a code um, to be able to authorize your new registration on WeChat. But it is doable. You will always find somebody in your vicinity who has WeChat where you can get subscribed. Um, without WeChat, really this topic today won't make sense. WeChat is your catalog of business cards whether it's with third parties, whether it's with potential candidates, whether it's getting an education, because there are many programs where you can get, get connected to chambers of commerce, and it's a way of starting conversations. WeChat is the number one app used in China for communication. So if you don't have it, you've got to get it. And the other is virtual networking events. Um, I've just put that inside here because um, organizations are organizing this. I have personally never done one just from time, from a time perspective, just not having that at that time. Um, but don't also underestimate virtual networking events that a lot of the chambers are organizing or associations are organizing. They can also be extremely, extremely useful. Um, one thing that I want to highlight just on this is that um, collect everybody's name. You will never know who can become of value to you in the future. Um, 
uh, you meet people at virtual trade shows and you're like, oh, I've added them on WeChat. They're, they're useless to me right now. Or they, they're useless to me is what people say. I'm going to delete them. Never delete because you just never know how these individuals will evolve over time and where they, they can become of use to you for your business in China. Manfred, do you want to add anything on that? Maybe just again on WeChat for, for those of you who, who haven't kind of been uh, playing around in the China garden for the last 20 years, email feels pretty much like stone age to Chinese people. So, you know, running around and saying, I've sent you an email just because you can do that, just because we do that in Europe, doesn't mean that that's how it's done in China. So just kind of to show you that we're not saying it would be a good idea to have WeChat. We're saying a lot of the serious communication in China, in business and off business, is simply happening in WeChat. Um, so yes, it is crucial to have it. And it's not just China, you know. A lot of Asia is just more digitalized than we sometimes like to accept and think and believe in Central Europe. So. Okay. You know, go have that. If that is the only thing you take away from this talk today, um, download WeChat and add Christina and myself. Um, I'll put my, my WeChat contact details in there as well. Um, yeah. All right. So to start off today, the first question that we had in the agenda was, who are the key individuals to start your operation? And again, Manfred and I might have very different perspectives on this. I was very much thinking how to present this information. So I've done the best way. I know how. Um, how I look at answering that question is, is understanding what functions do I need in, in the China operation, okay? Um, what do I need to actually do? Versus thinking about titles and roles, I'm actually thinking, what are the responsibilities that I need people to perform in order to get myself implemented and in order to get the ball rolling in the Chinese market. I've listed eight items here, and it is all a matter of how you prioritize these functions depending on the stage that you are in in your business, okay? I would have preferred to put administration up by number one. I've put it down as number eight. Um, this has nothing to do with my priority listing. It's just the order that I've put it in. Um, don't, don't take it literally that strategy should be number one, marketing and branding number two. It's just how my mind was thinking at the time of writing this. So for me, it's strategy. Who's going to help with the China strategy? Who's going to implement that China strategy? Who's going to have that overall view of your organization in China and push it forward? Who's going to do marketing and branding, right? You are an overseas brand getting into China. Do people know you? What marketing strategy are you developing specifically to get known in the market? And who's going to perform this work? Sales. Are you going to use distributors? Are you going to use third parties? Or are you going to build up an in-house sales team to push sales and, and start having these client relationships? Customer service. Manfred highlighted this on Monday's session. Customer service is something that is put lower down on a priority list, but it should be considered together with sales. So are your salespeople going to do the customer service? Will you have a different division that does customer service? How are you going to implement that as a function? And it in my mind, it should be separated. You've got technical engineering. I wanted to put something in there that was technically oriented because you might be in an industry or sector where there is a, an engineering component to your product whether it's implementing a machine, whether it's doing after sales repair service, whether it's getting spare parts put in, you might need mechanical electrical engineers on the ground who do the technical work, right? Again, very specific to what industry and sector you might be in. Supply chain and logistics. You know, what is, who's gonna be doing the demand forecasting? Who is going to be communicating with warehouses, uh, logistics providers? Who is going to be communicating to the production site? You need somebody who's going to handle the whole supply chain and all the components and discussions that are along that journey of a product from start to finish. Innovation. 
Now, innovation might not be a priority today, but if you come at a point in six months in time and you say, it's funny, our product isn't selling. Why isn't our product selling? And you do a little bit of research and you're discovering that actually the packaging has to change. The packaging has to have Chinese on it. You need to change the flavors of your product. This is all for me part of innovation R&D. And for me, again, that is something that should not be overlooked because you, if sales is not happening within the first six months, there has to be a reason for it. And you need to analyze, is it related to the product itself? And does the product then have to be adapted? So for me, that's in, in the innovation department. And then last but not least, my favorite department is administration and everything that is under administration. So this is recruitment. You have your HR division, which is recruitment, headhunting, onboarding of employees, offboarding of employees, payroll functions. You've got accounting, finance, tax. You've got legal, corporate governance, and compliance. That for me is all under administration. Okay. Now, the, after I analyze the functions, and again, depending on the industry and sector you are in, you might be adding additional one or two different categories. You might want to have a data analytics person. You might want to have a software engineer. That for me falls under technical. You have to analyze your business depending on what you're doing. But this for me is a good starting point of the functions. Now the question then comes, what are those roles? So I've put in roles. Um, head of China is strategy. Marketing manager is marketing and branding. Sales is commercial manager. I find that a lot of people need to have a clear understanding of functions together with titles. Um, people in China love titles. Um, when you are a startup in China, as a head of China, I couldn't care less about your title because I need you to be flexible. If I'm starting up my operation with one person, this person is probably gonna do all eight of these functions. Maybe not all eight, but is gonna to touch in all of these and then functions. Then the person is soon gonna be leaving again. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but as a startup, you've got to analyze a little bit. You know, you need somebody with a great deal of flexibility. Um, and sometimes employees can be very much fixated on titles versus really understanding what their responsibilities are and their job description is. Um, I then wanted to touch on, again, who are these key individuals you need? And obviously, you can in-house all of that. But maybe in your startup phase, you might want to outsource a lot of those functions. Head of, when you're talking about strategy and you've got the head of China, I mean, that has to be in-house, all right? But if you're looking at all of the other roles and functions, a lot of those things can be outsourced. Branding marketing to media agencies, PR agencies. Sales, you might want to use distributors, licensees, franchisees. Um, TPs can also be considered as types of distributors. The supply chain and logistics, you can outsource that to logistics providers, warehousing facilities. You might find you want to use import-export agents to facilitate the trade flow. From an administration perspective, you probably won't hire everybody in-house. You might outsource to lawyers, accounting firms, headhunters, auditing firms. So there are a lot of functions that you can actually outsource initially. Um, and if you do outsource it, please do speak to at least three providers to get a comparison on your comfort level with them and their pricing, all right? Um, um, so that you have the ability basically to compare. Manfred, you're on. <laughs> Great. So, I looked a little bit at um, the folks we're having on here. So when, when, I, when I understand that correctly, um, we're having people from real estate, we're having people from universities, people with roughly speaking kind of medical products, and then maybe also um, incoming service providers. Um, and then we have something roughly in a range of, of, of textiles. So I see two different um, regions, I assume for the universities, you know, we're probably more talking about incoming sort of China business, whereas for most of the other organizations, I suppose we're talking selling into China. Um, for the incoming business, obviously, we need to have either a person in China to support that. 
um, for those that are kind of selling to China and selling in China, I see two kind of different approaches. Um, one is the cautious, careful, um, if it brings me a euro or a pound, I can spend a pound or a little bit less of that. The other approach is maybe the more, uh, the faster one, you know, either because the, the market window is smaller, is, uh, you, you need to be fast, otherwise you lose the opportunity. Um, it could also simply be that you already have a certain size and that you decide now is the time to actually do that. And so I see two different approaches when it comes to the, the key individuals. Um, the bottom-up approach, which, which I call face or, or organic growth. In that sense, and, and we're having a lot of clients that we support this way, what normally happens is you went into China, you probably started with distributors. You've been doing that for a while. It works. And now is the time for you to kind of say, I need to step up the game. Now, it depends if you're B2C, if you're B2B. Um, it depends, again, on how quickly you kind of want to move. I see organizations saying, I'm happy with the distributors, I'll just implement marketing. So what they do is they set up an organization, going back to Christina's way, they say it needs to have that marketing functionality. So we need to have a sort of marketing guy. And then within that thing, you know, it depends. Some say, I want to start with the GM and underneath that I built a team. Other people say, we just start with that first person and then we'll, we'll, we'll step it up. That depends. Others, they kind of already see that their distributors, as nice as they are, they are not doing half of the job they promised to do. So there maybe is more necessary to actually establish on one hand side, you still let some distributors alive, whereas you already kind of go in and establish your own sales on the other end. Could be for the same market segments in different territories, for example, Northeast China is important, but the distributor is bad. So you install a person taking care of sales there, while Sichuan is extremely important, but the distributor works, you leave Sichuan to itself for the time being. So this way, you know, you can, you can step it up without creating too much conflict, because what you always need to understand is you, you started the business with some Chinese distributor for five years. And even if it's a Western distributor, and then you come in and take all that away, people react. And you need to be careful with that sort of reaction that you get. Um, because if that reaction is a bit too heavy, uh, then you've just successfully bombarded your China business. Some of that, obviously, you can recover and some of that you can fix. Um, but but you, you prefer to have that kind of revenue and, and profit curve as opposed to this and then and then you kind of go up again. Um, so yeah, thinking along those lines, um, you can you know have a national sales manager and, and, and build that team. You can you can put that person in charge of everything. You might also want to kind of go around again depending on your, your resources where you put two people in place. Why? Um, you put one people in place, you, we Europeans have that tendency to simply trust people. We say, now, Mark, you're in charge of China, you're a good man, you leg it. We're 8,000 kilometers away. How, how are we supposed to know that he's good? Even if a Western GM is sitting next to that person, it's hard to know if he's good, you know? So if you have two, you, you get some sense of comparison. If you have two, you also have a backup in case one is, you know, leaving in case one is dropping out. I, I fully understand that this has got financial implications going back to yesterday, to what Christina said. This is why both Christina and myself are such big proponents of, you know, let's look at this. What ways do we have? How can we, you know, if we're talking about, I don't know, 400,000 RMB a year, that's 50,000 euros a year. If you say you have two and you go with them and after six months or after a year, you decide that you only have one anymore, it's more investment of let's say 25 to 50,000 euros 
with a higher certainty, less risk. So it's for you to judge, does it work, does it not work? It's our job to give you that idea and that option and that scenario to mm -hmm. say, which one do you prefer? Can you digest high risk? And can you handle also if you fall? Or are you the one where you say, well, mm, you know, let's, let's, let's create the path with, without that much risk? Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends. If you talk about these key individuals, it's easy to say we need that role. The question that most people kind of forget is we're talking about a bridge. So if you have been running and building countries in Asia for the last 30 years, I'd reckon you can deal with many scenarios. If you've never even been to China once, you will not be able to actually lead all sorts of different Chinese salespeople. You know, we can find you a cheap one. We can find you one that's never worked in an international company, but I don't think that's the one you will want. Christina and me had a thing the other day where she said, you know, sometimes people are just happy because they now have an accountant that speaks English. The same thing is happening with salespeople. And, and yes, that has implications on the finances, but it's stuff that, you know, we need to consider. We're having one case in the UK now where uh, an institution that is selling to the academia is kind of putting in a strong first man because they want to um, simply up their game in China. The person in charge is very smart, is very strategic, and is expecting that kind of strategic mindset from that person in China. So it's not so much the person who kind of gets going right away. It's more the person who can do the big picture, look at all the segments, and then say, we start with this segment and we leave the other two for later. You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of thinking that these nuances that very often actually decide, will it work or will you fail? It's, it's not a zero or one. It's a, has this person 10 years of experience with Western companies or five, can this person speak English? Does this person tell me? Or does this person has that Asian habit of communication that he will never say when there's something wrong and I'll never have an idea why we're actually not you know, progressing. So it's, it's these kind of things that are much more interesting and I find much more relevant for the success than the title or the CV or that kind of stuff. So you know, think about it. The bridge, you here in Europe and that person in China, and there needs to be a working link. Otherwise, it, it, it will be tricky. Um, if we go away from the bottom up approach, and if we say, out of whatever reason, you know, we need to be fast, let's say we've been, we've neglected the Chinese market for a little bit. The Chinese market grew, it developed, our competitors are there, everybody's there, we are not there then if you make that decision from ownership or management level, then you might need to go a tad faster. You know, then, then that approach of, you know, I'll kind of see what happens in the next three years. I would then raise the question, is it really still necessary then to go at all? Then maybe you just need to refocus on other markets and double down your efforts there, as opposed to actually, you know, going into a market where you're already late to the party and you're not committed because you want to go slow and be cautious. From, from, from my end, you know, that very often becomes tricky. You can do it, yes, but you know, you still need to pay attention to that market. If you don't have that attention, if you don't have the resources, maybe it's better not to do. So if you need to go fast, I think you need to build, uh, you build it from the top. You bring in a strong general manager. I just had a conversation today with a client of ours, um, automotive company, 200 people, about 10 people in, in China. They have neglected the market for a while. What do they do? They bring in a really, a really well experienced man on top to start changing things. And, and, and you see it, you know, either you bring it in to change things or you bring him in to build it up. And then obviously you need to, you need to go faster if you go that approach. Then obviously the expectation would also be that this top man can help you to bring in part of the team. If you have a top man who can't bring in anybody, that raises a red flag. Why? 
then maybe somehow the the, the perception um, you know is a little bit is a little bit off. Also, if you think this way, you know, just keep in mind if you have a general manager in charge of an organization between 10 to 50 people, it might be well worth paying for the assistant to make sure that this person can free his time for the most important things and not trying to give every task to that person because you say, I'd, I'd rather do you everything yourself, you know. Um, also try and think a little bit about, about efficiency. Um, Christina, I'll hand back to you, or do you want to want to have a question to me or add something? Or I think just on that point of the hierarchical approach, you know, I was saying when you do a startup in China, um, you are probably going to do a first hire where, you know, like I said in my previous slide, they're going to touch on each of the little functions, right? Each of these eight little functions. So Manfred's approach actually to get support staff like an assistant is invaluable. People underestimate this. If you are trying to get into China with speed and a proper structure, one person cannot do everything. It's impossible. There's not enough hours in the day. So they will need support, whether it's through an assistant or, I don't know, a salesman, a salesperson or, or whatever. You can call this person whatever you would like. Um, I like the idea of the assistant because people underestimate the amount of administrative bureaucracy that exists in China. And, and you know, it's it's also the small things. I mean, in the past, much more so, you would you would have right away the assistant. You would also have right away the driver. Yeah. It's it, you know that kind of thing. It's just also signaling to the outside world, to the world around you, that you know you you are somebody. If you're trying to tell them, you know, I just started. I'm the GM and I'm alone. And I'll be alone for the next three years. Nobody will take you serious, you know. Yeah. Then you might ask, you know, why do I spend all the money for the GM? If that is your approach, which is fine, you know. If that is your approach, then then don't go the GM route. Go the bottom up approach route, which is yeah. fine. Then then you have a get a strong sales guy uh, who needs to leg it, and uh, yeah, that's that's good as well. It's a feasible approach. It's just uh, from from a speed and resource perspective very different um, approach yeah all right so the next question that we have is where are they located in or out of china so i'm going to be talking a little bit more broadly about whether they should be in or out of china and i think manfred will look more in depth about china itself because china is huge so what i've done is i've taken the previous slide where i've looked at the functions, the roles, and my suggestions. Now, none of this is perfect. I'm actually thinking about it in terms of COVID pandemic and what we've done at Woodburn. Um, so that's sort of what I'm looking at. Um, in terms of strategy, getting a foreigner into China right now, I don't wanna use the word impossible. It is difficult, complex, and there is not a single timeline that you can provide. I also would not generally advise bringing an expat in um, unless they realize the consequences of that once they are in China, they should not be exiting because going in and out is very, very difficult. Once you get that visa nowadays, you go in, you stay in, okay? Um, so I, out of flexibility reasons, I've said, you know, the head of China can be based abroad, can somebody be, can be somebody in the HQ, but their job function should be on a daily basis, China. They should be in touch with all the third parties or people that are running the business, and they should be in the HQ from a strategical standpoint. In terms of the roles from basically two to eight, the only two where I would say maybe initially you don't necessarily need somebody on the ground is supply chain and logistics because you might want to have a demand manager that's sitting abroad. Head of R&D can also be sitting abroad. It's just that these people should be communicating then with folks in China about what's going on in terms of getting research, understanding why sales is happening, not happening, et cetera. And also just making sure that the supply chain is running fluidly and efficiently. For all the other roles, marketing, sales, customer service, technical engineering, administration, this needs to be in China. And whether you outsource those roles or bring them in-house, that's up to you. But those functions have to happen in China. 
there's absolutely no need for your marketing team in your head office to be doing marketing initiatives in China and thinking that they can replicate what they do abroad in China. Sales, if you wanna build traction and you wanna have speed, you need someone on the ground who's, who's moving around. Customer service is the same. Engineering, it's a hands-on job. So you need somebody on the ground. Admin, again, a lot of companies do this. They start off in China and they're like, we'll do the administration from HQ. And then you realize you can't get connected to the tax office. You don't know what the corporate governance regulations are. You don't know what, how compliance works. It just does not work. Okay? You need somebody on the ground that's facilitating it. So this is just my perspective. If you plan on outsourcing any functions, again, you outsource to people who have companies in China. And just make sure you're vetting those companies. You understand their history. How, how long have they been in market? Talk to two, three different providers, get an understanding of pricing and comfort um, and, uh, and what their added value would be to you. Manfred, your turn. Um, before I switch on my slides, I would, I would kind of uh, want to add on the strategy part. Uh, I think at the moment, what's been happening before COVID is that there is that, that, that term that's being used, the decoupling. Uh, it's coming kind of from the IT end, but the more COVID is actually prolonged, the more you know, decoupling is going on, the more we are moving away from the West and the East or from China and, and, and Europe, to be precise, in, in, in that kind of case. Because of that, I feel China kind of has taken a different turn and there's a lot of small but very important things on the local reality changing or that have already changed. So my personal perception is that in terms of how to reach certain revenue goals and certain financial goals in China, you need to have that feedback, you know, from, from your team there. And obviously that feedback needs to flow kind of into the strategy. So I would see that strategy responsibility shared between the ideas from headquarters and whoever is kind of having the PL responsibility for the China entity. Um, because again, you know, you, you, you need to adapt, you need to be, you need to be agile. Um, looking at my slide, did the sharing work, Christina? Yep. Um, looking at my slide, you know, and where to be located, I did not differentiate between Europe and China. I more kind of looked at which places in China generally make sense, right? Um, I think, especially because of... Uh, COVID, especially because of flying back and forth, getting trickier and trickier, we should generally be looking at, you know, people inside China. If you want to create linking pins, I'm not so much looking at location. I'm more looking at which people can link. You know, Chinese people who used to live in Europe, they can link. European people who lived in China, they can link. Uh, bringing in some random European that's got no experience with China whatsoever, and having the expectation that they are a good linking pin, you know, I, I, I beg to differ. Um, it, it can be something, it can be at the very beginning, but um, it's it, yeah, tricky. Um, in terms of generality, Shanghai is a good business hub. However, more important, the question is like, wh where are your clients and how to reach them? Um, if we say clients really are everywhere, then we need to talk about a structure where we have salespeople kind of everywhere. If we say we are having one client in the vicinity of Shanghai and eight other clients down close to Hong Kong, then that gives us a very clear picture. Now, some of you will say, but I don't know where they are. See, that's the point with the data where we come again. You need to collect that in one way or the other. You need to figure out in one way or the other where and also understand why like why is it then north of hong kong maybe you're somehow related to the electronics manufacturing and maybe you benefit if apple is you know producing a new iphone you've got something to do in in, in that sort of sphere um, then it's different places maybe you want to attract people for your great university in in the west then you might not even want to you know go into shanghai and fish where 200 other universities are fishing. You maybe want to go to two, tier two, tier three cities to find people whose parents are 
affluent enough to afford it um, and yet not playing on that international level uh, that they have your 10 other competitors right in front of their nose to be admitted there. So that is the combination of reality and strategy because the better your strategy, the less resources you need. The worse your strategy, the more you need to really, you know, push against the flow and bring in more and more people and do more and more listening and more and more understanding to, 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 to kind of re, re adapt. So I do a lot um, with that. And then obviously, you know, there's simply logistical things. Once we're after the pandemic to say, can I reach that place? You know, can we bring in people from HQ to have that in terms of where they are located? You know, you always want to be careful that you choose a location where you can build a great team. If you're going out too far into the suburbs, if you're going out too far into places where there's actually nobody, then don't expect to be able to attract the best talent because you will not. You know, why should somebody move to a place where even most of Chinese have never heard of? They will not, is the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in terms of the support functions, try, try, and, try and leave it in, you know? I'm pretty much a fan of, in terms of location, have, have that in one place because you also need, you need speed, you need momentum, you know? You need, to, you need to build momentum as we speak. Christina, back to you. All right. Um, let me go back to the slides. So the next question is the scenarios for employing people in China. Um, and we're, we're running a bit out of time. So I'm just gonna go through this um, quickly. Option one, very simply, is you do a direct employment between a Chinese company and employee in mainland China. So that means you set up a company in China, you use that entity as the employer and you can employ people through that entity. It's a formal um, employment relationship. Option two is labor dispatch arrangements, which is between, China, the, between the Chinese company and usually it is for flexible employees. Labor dispatch arrangements means that you use a payroll agent, a local Chinese payroll agent to actually hire flexible employees. So for example, let's say you're in a manufacturing company and you've got certain peak seasons. You might need to get an influx of laborers to come in for that peak season. They are considered as flexible employees. You might not want to sign direct employment agreements with them. So you would use a labor dispatch company to do that employment, okay? Again, this will not be, a, option two is not really applicable to everybody, but I want everyone to know what all options are, all right? Option three is part-time employees. Now for me, again, this is an option. Do people do it? Not really. Um, I don't know anybody, I've never worked with any client. I've never done it myself where I've hired part-time employees. I think it's useless. Why not just get a full-time employee to work fully on your behalf? Um, you need to really analyze if this makes sense. There's always going to be issues with part-time employment when it comes to social insurance and housing fund contributions and how that is going to be calculated. So you can come into very difficult discussions with employees who feel like they're not getting the full contributions when actually anyhow they're part-time staff. And there's not a full labor um, law agreement around this concept. Independent contractors. So if you have employees, people that you would actually like to hire, but you don't have an entity on the ground and you're like, yeah, I'm going to hire them um, through my Chinese company, but they're going to be independent contractors. Well, they need to have their own entity to be able to invoice. In China, to do any forms of payment, there has to be a paperwork flow. And you need to have FAPIAOs, which are official uh, invoices that are then distributed. For every outbound payment in domestic China, you need to have a FAPIAO showing that payment. Otherwise, it can't be booked in your accounting, in your accounting books. So independent contractors are possible, but they have to have their own company in China to be able to invoice you for their services. Option five is around the employer of record service, where we've actually spoken about on the previous two sessions, 
where you can use an intermediary company to actually fully employ an individual that works full time on your behalf. All right. Um, those are the five options. Okay, and now I'm going to raise two questions that I think are vital for anybody who's doing market entry into China, because they will think that these are potentially solutions. The first question is, can you hire in China without a legal presence? No. If you want to hire individuals who are residing in mainland China, those individuals should be employed by an entity that is registered in China whether it's foreign owned, locally owned, whatever, okay? There needs to be a formal engagement with those individuals. And that's because of social insurance and housing fund issues, as well as tax issues, all right? The next question is, because that's how people are gonna twist the words, can you hire a freelancer in China from abroad? This means that you've got a person sitting in China that you would actually like to hire. You don't want to set up an entity. You don't want to use the employer of record service. So you are just doing an informal agreement from your UK, US, German head office with this individual. Now, freelancers in China, there is actually no governing law on freelancers, all right? Because the law states that mainland Chinese people residing in China need to be legally employed by a registered entity in China. If you go the route of choosing this option of going and hiring freelancers, realize that that contract is not binding in China, realize that the individual does have tax obligations and should be declaring individual income tax in China. In the majority of cases, they do not. And one item I didn't mention here is they should also, because they are receiving an income, be declaring social insurance and housing fund, but only from the employee side, which again, many individuals don't do. Now, I wanna provide you with worst case scenarios that I've seen. You could have a falling out with a freelancer. This freelancer out of revenge tactics goes to the labor arbitration committee and says, I've been illegally employed by this company from abroad. I want action to be taken. Now, in worst case scenario, if this is not solved smoothly, and most of the time it's because they want some level of compensation, then you could be put on a blacklist in that city where this freelancer has gone to the labor arbitration committee um, and potentially might not be able to register a company there. So I want everybody to take this option seriously um, because it is a very gray scenario for China and you have no proper law that is governing this relationship. Manfred, do you want to add anything on the different options and scenarios? All good, Christina. All good okay. is already, it's already time is advancing. All right. Now the big question is what is the cost of having these people on board? Um, and what I've done is I've created, um, I've just done these simulations for a client last week, so they're fresh in my mind. I've done a simulation for two employees in China that are going to be based in Shenzhen. So what you need to understand when you are calculating salaries in China now is that you've got to look at the annual gross income. Why? Because individual income tax is calculated based on the annual gross income of an employee. And every month, a, a, the monthly calculation of that income tax is set aside at the tax bureau. And there's an accumulation that is done um, month to month. So you will probably pay less income tax in January and more income tax in December to level then out the income tax for the annual income. Um, SI stands for Social Insurance and Housing Fund. This is split between the employer and the employee. And every single city has different rates specific to that standard of living in that city. So when you're looking at this breakdown, please do note that this is for two individuals who have a Shenzhen Huko. Huko means residency, and they are going to be based in Shenzhen. Um, so although you've got a gross salary of 31,000 per month, the total payable by the employer per month will be about 38,000. Okay, 
you're looking at somebody with a gross salary of 38,000 per month, you're going to look at a total payable by the employer of 46,000. Okay. And that comes down to the gross salary plus then the social insurance that's paid by the employer. If anybody has questions on this, I'm happy to give information and guidance, but due to the shortness of time, it's just to give you an idea of how the breakdown is on the payroll. Just, just one thing on those things, Christina, if you, if you may still have your, uh, your slide open. Um, from a Central European perspective, you know, I, I have person from city A, um, move him to city B and, and, you know, do this, do that, you know, no, no, no big thing. I take him from central Germany and employ him in Munich in southern Germany, all easy. That sort of moving around in China is creating a lot of headache or, you know, um, to learn an important Chinese word, mafan. It, it, it's complicated. It, it creates a lot of, uh, yeah, mafan. So be careful with that. The easiest way is you find somebody in Shanghai, you employ somebody in Shanghai. Um, why is that? Because the Chinese social security system is, is not really, you know, unified and integrated. Um, so one account in one place is not just easily exchangeable or mergeable with another one. There's also different rates. There is different expectations what you can when you retire and so on and so forth. So just keep it in mind um, because it is very often something that then makes a good candidate shy away or actually go away if he cannot have it his way. Um, but yet on the other hand side, the way the system is, is not so easy to simply, you know, um, give it to people that way. Shall I share my slide, Christina? Um, sure. Let me just conclude with what I consider as considerations, and Manfred will then give ideas of salary levels. But for me, the considerations when you're looking at the cost is looking at the gross salary, annual compensation with commission bonus, looking at the income tax uh, implications, the social insurance housing fund contributions. If you're hiring foreigners, think about the visa requirements. Think about any additional allowances. Think about additional insurances, for example, personal medical insurances, travel insurances, et cetera. And then any company policies that you might have during working hours, right? Um, that for me is how, what you have to think about when you're managing then employees um, um, and having a working relationship with them. Manfred, go ahead with the- and Just before, before I move on to my slide, Christina said a word that in two years ago was, a no-brainer. These days, it's 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 actually Pandora Visa. At the moment, it's simply a disaster to get a visa. And if you just have a person that says sales manager, um, forget it. That is the the concise, condensed experience kind of of the last twelve months. Yes, there is always ways. Yes, there is always a route, but these things used to be just, as I said, a no-brainer at the moment, simply just getting a visa for somebody to, you know, come in for a while is really, really, really difficult. Huh? Doable, yes, but really difficult. Um, all right, so let me move on to this slide here. That is um, the costs of a general manager, and that is a while ago. Um, I've, I've taken that example because I think it's still a little bit easier digestible. Very often when SMEs come to us looking for a general manager, they'd be kind of going to a maybe a limit of 100,000 euros, of 120,000 euros. So to put it in simple terms, roughly like 800,000 RMB, somewhere, somewhere along those lines. Um, Christina, I think, said it yesterday or the day before, it's uh, China just definitely isn't cheap anymore. So going to that option where you want to hire somebody who can go fast, um, who know what he's doing, is not just throwing money out of the window, but you know, proven track record is the, the, the term we're looking for. Um, if that is the case, then uh, 100,000 very often for a GM of a sales organization, just won't do it. You might get lucky if somebody just made the wrong move, if somebody just got fired for the wrong reasons, that sort of thing. You could get lucky, 
um, but very often really it you know it it doesn't work. Uh, you need to go up to a million, 1.2 million. If you're going for the top-notch people, then it's it's even 1.6 million RMB to 2 million RMB. It, it depends also, you know. Um, that again, going back to yesterday, that goes into the budget. And that creates frictions within your organization because somebody will say, that is 30% more than we pay here. Or somebody will say, that doesn't fit our salary structure. We will not do it. So it, it raises questions of, of you know, principal questions. Not just, do we have the money? Do we not have the money? You know, it raises a question, do we want to pay those guys more than the guys in the US? And those sort of things um, create difficult dynamics. So, you know, if you want to take something away from this slide, then take away that normally the GM positions, the good ones, they get really expensive in China these days. And that's what you get when you get the good ones. If you want to go substantially below, then you need to do much more communication, much more handholding. Your risk goes substantially up and you'll need more nanny work from the headquarters. Uh, if we look at something else, something like a, a first sales or a first BD person, and this here is in, in, in a technology field, um, technology field with the segments, market segments are shipyards, market segments are construction machinery, um, market segments are in industrial factories, that sort of thing. Um, we're having, and this here is the gross, the gross salary. Uh, we're having gross salaries between roughly An annual, right? Manfred, annual, annual gross salary. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we're having annual gross salary from roughly 400 to 600 K. And sometimes we even see, you know, larger, larger spreads. What will be important for you though, for the first salesperson is really to think about how much is the bonus? And how do I structure that bonus? Don't just think about year one. Think about three years, you know? Build, build that ramp for three years that they see I can earn more and more. That is also a way that you can actually, you know, sometimes start with a rather low level and then, you know, you, you build it up, but don't fool people, you know? Create an incentive structure that you can stick to. Sometimes people, what they do is they say, you know, we'll tie to the revenue and then the revenue starts flowing in and they want to cap it. Don't, you know, create an incentive structure that you can actually stick to, uh, to motivate your team, to motivate the first person and then kind of to, to get on going. For these sort of things, um, one of the crucial things is always these people need to speak, you know, good English. You need to be able to communicate with them. That is one cost driver. The other cost driver is these people most of the times will need to have worked in Western companies to be able to communicate with you in a way that makes sense. You know, um, these numbers look different if you take somebody in a very far away city who doesn't speak English and who has access to the market segments, but these people don't fit as a first person. They don't make sense because you can't communicate with them. So how are you going to learn? How are you going to move ahead? And so on and so forth. Christina, please. All right. So this gives you an idea, basically, um, overall, on what functions, roles would be needed. Do you want to take a bottom-up approach or a hierarchical approach? Um, what options you have to hire people? And it's giving you an understanding of the salaries levels, salary breakdowns, et cetera. Um, so we wanted to end uh, the presentation today, again, with a, just a discussion point between, between Manfred and I on what are the challenges and solutions in building this network of people. Um, so for me, I'm going I'm to start off Manfred and then I'll lead you to the next point, but what, let's limit it to two or three points. Okay. Um, so we've got room for Q&A. So for me, the first challenge is always finding that right Person. And I put right in apostrophes, right? Because you need to define what is right for you. Um, you need to create a characteristics list on what you foresee as having in this person, right? Um, 
what are the main skill sets you must have in this individual? What experiences would you like them to have had in this, in this uh, work experience thus far, right? Finding the right person is always going to be tricky. The only thing that I can say out of personal experience when you have that first hire is if your gut is telling you over time that this is not the right fit, get rid of them as soon as possible. Do not wait. That was probably one of the biggest mistakes I have made in my 18 years within my first five years of operating in China. I was so scared of rocking the boat and the repercussions and consequences of letting go of key people until the day that I did it. And I eventually got the right people in the right roles. And you know, you kick yourself in the head saying, what an idiot were you for not doing it sooner, right? So I just wanna emphasize that. You might not be lucky the first time to get the right person, right? Manfred will discuss a little bit about the solutions on, on doing that type of homework, but just know that if it isn't the right fit, get rid of them sooner rather than later. I think adding to, may, may I, Christina? Do yes, you want yes, Christina no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think adding, adding on this one, but still seeing it as a separate point, you need to build trust. You're sitting here, you're sitting in Europe. Somebody in your organization said, China is an important market, China is a strategic market. Now you found that person, that person's there, that person as you've hired them and as they've joined your company, you know that that hiring process is a mutual process. They want to. So now you also need to, you know, show them respect, give them trust. How do you not show respect? By not communicating. How do you not show respect? By not having a weekly sure fix with that person. How do you not build trust? By, you know, not delivering on their needs. These people have information needs. These people are driven. These people, you know, you, you've given them a target. You said 1 million RMB, or you said 10 million RMB, or you said 50 million RMB, depending on the sort of thing and the sort of setup that you have. Uh, you know, you need to support them. And there needs to be trust that, 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 that bridge, you know, if it's just the paper construct is no good for nobody. So hence, you need that trust. You know, WeChat, Christina and me, were not just proponents of WeChat because we say, oh, you know, it's got a different sticker to it. So that's why we like it. No, it's because people use it. It's because people, you know, shout at eight in the evening, you know, I need some support. Or they do that kind of at nine hour end when it's six in the morning on the Chinese end. And it's not always fun, you know, to be responsive, to, to, to deal with that. But that's how you build that trust in each other, right? That's how you, you signal to the team that we, we, we make this work together. And I think that is something that is extremely important. And also, it doesn't quite come naturally because at least here in Austria or in Southern Germany, you know, when we're talking about work, we do not go into the family. We do not go into your kids. We do not go into all that what is considered kind of personal life which is different in China. You have that new employee, that GM, and you never inquire about his family, you'll get the perception you don't care about him. And so there's a couple of, you know, small nuances and, and pitfalls in here that you actually need to, to learn. Christina, back to you. So for me, again, one of the biggest challenges is finding that right candidate, right? And analyzing again, what characteristics you need. The next biggest challenge is onboarding and particularly during COVID times, how are you going to onboard? And again, when I say network of people, this can be employees, but it's also onboarding a third party provider, right? How are you gonna go through that onboarding process? Now, it's a two way street here. You can create an onboarding process, process from the HQ, but you should also challenge your third parties, employees in China to also create an agenda, right? What is on their onboarding? Um, list or agenda. But ultimately, make sure you've got an onboarding. Don't forget to do the onboarding. Some reason, many people are like, oh, we've gone through this now recruitment process, this, this headhunting process. We poached somebody from a competitor. So we make the assumption they know exactly what they're going to do from day one. And you're like, all right, I'll talk to you in two weeks and I'll see what results you've done. 
No, you spend those first two weeks daily on training, on, Manfred used the word, informational sessions. Uh, you've got to give them information. You've got to share the philosophy and the mission of the company. Give them a global scale of what is happening within the organization and that China is part of that market share. Um, motivate them, entice them. Uh, you want them to have a twinkle in their eye every day when they're going to the office. And if you forget to do that onboarding, um, you're not gonna get a relationship and grasp actually the essence of the individual that you're hiring or that third party that you're hiring. You've gotta make sure you do that onboarding. And I think, I think that is a, a very good and a very suitable word here, relationship. That's what you wanna build, you know, um, with intention with the right intentions to, to build this sort of relationship. Um, kind of adding on, on, on all these challenges, I think I'll use something that is a bit more um, loose or a bit more broad, uh, but still, you know, even with the people, even with your network and everything, you want to have the right structure. Even with something like the first person in communication, what is the right structure? What, like, you know, which channels, um, which intervals of speaking to them, the kind of information that flows, where does that go? Now, some of you can say, well, it's, it's too much, it's overthinking it, it's stretching it. That's true, but the thing is, you want to develop a picture of the Chinese market. You know, come yearly planning session. Of course, you can just say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll grow 30%, we'll grow 50%, we'll double. You can do that, but you've got nothing on your hand to kind of say how. If you have it somehow structured and have an idea of where these clients are, why stuff there is exploding, where these other clients are, why they are very you know, silent and nothing's happening there, it's much easier for you to actually do something and to act. My finding with many Chinese employees, not all, but many Chinese employees is that sort of proactivity, that sort of structure finding, tendentionally is not their strength. So there'll need to be some guidance, some sort of support to, you know, to do that, especially when you're starting. Because once you have these, that structure defined, you can also say that information goes in there, that information goes in there. And then when you have time again, you can you can look at it, you can look at it together with your employee, you can look at it with your bosses, with your VP sales, with, with whatnot. You want to start somewhere and that somewhere can be, you know, as simple as a shared document, as simple as an Excel sheet, as simple as a, I don't know, a, a page from Mac that you share with your colleague in China, whatever, you know, don't, don't, don't overthink it at the beginning, but do start somewhere and get the ball rolling. And do, you know, keep, keep regularly asking yourself, do, do, do I have the right structure? What, what do I need to change? Because the right structure with one employee is not the right with five or with 10 or with 20 or with 50. It's again, you know, it's a startup. Maybe, uh, maybe I can share a little bit um, my processes for communication, um, just so you guys have an idea of how it could potentially work. Um, Every single Monday, I have an internal meeting with my right-hand person. And that meeting is a minimum of one hour. And it's blocked in my calendar for the entire year, 52 weeks of the year. Um, and there is nothing that will come between that meeting. It's just in the diary. The other is a strategic meeting. So one is an internal meeting to kind of fight fires, deal with cases, employees, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week basis. But then I also have a strategic meeting with key individuals within the organization who are there to look at the KPIs and the goals and objectives that we have set forth, set forth for the year. And that strategic meeting is once a month, the, the last Friday of every single month. And again, it's in the diary, it's fixed. So for me, again, I'm service oriented. So it's not as complicated as for example, trade or manufacturing or R&D. Um, that is what we do to maintain communication because simply I'm not on the ground and I have to have those conversations with my team. So that's what we've implemented in the last 12, more than 18 months. Uh, and, that is, and that is beautiful because there is clear expectations, right? Correct. 
people right. know that they have a space when to address these strategic issues. And that sort of expectation setting, you will find there is people from large organizations, they're good at that. But there's a lot of other people who are not good at that. Yeah. They don't know when to bring stuff in. And then when they have an opportunity, they flood you with 20 items and then you just drown. So I think that's, that's important. Um, I think the key thing now, because we're really running out of time, is to um, talk very quickly on certain questions. So there was a question here about, is there a management fee paid by the employer to the labor bureau or the type of FESCO? I think Antoinette has, has already gone, so we might- I know, she, she, might, do, she might watch the recording, so I still okay. want to mention that. Um, there is a difference between the labor bureau and FESCO. FESCO is probably the most well-known um, payroll agent in China. They are a payroll agent. They're not a, they are state-owned payroll agent, but they're not actually governed by the, uh, they're not a government body. Um, so there is a difference between the labor bureau and the FESCO. Is there a management fee? Yes, there is a service fee that FESCO charges to use their services as a payroll agent. Does the labor bureau charge anything to file anything with them? No, there's no filing fee um, that's done with the labor bureau. Uh, Cho Li, you have a question, which is, if we hire a Beijing native living in Shanghai, does social insurance go to the person in Beijing, or he has to have a social insurance housing in Shanghai? Um, Cho Li, that depends on the hukou of the individual. So if the hukou is in Beijing and, and they have not transferred it over to Shanghai, which they could do if their plan is to live in Shanghai permanently, um, then they will pay the social insurance is based on the Beijing rates, or if they're residing in Shanghai, they can also apply to obtain the Shanghai rates. That's a very complex question. So I need to go more into detail about the background of the individual. What is their hukou status? Where would they like to get their social insurances? Do they want to move their hukou from Beijing to Shanghai? Yeah. Where is their family, exactly, where's their family living? Part is, for example, if it's a man, is the wife and kids still in Beijing and he's just living in Shanghai? We need to understand the background of the person to give you your options on how to approach it with him. Um, and that's all that's popped in. So again, for anybody that has any bigger questions, that is the whole purpose for tomorrow. Um, we will have this live Q&A. We will go through, everybody who turns up, we will go through their next three action points for the next 90 days. Um, and it is a great opportunity for you to have a brainstorming session with us, with the people that are on to share ideas. We're going to keep it an unmuted, open dialogue for tomorrow. Um, if you could type in what your biggest takeaway was for today, if you can add one word, that would be brilliant. Um, again, don't, don't forget to join us for tomorrow. And we've got one spot left for the quick, for the quick China strategy session. Um, please do email Manfred and I. Um, Manfred, can you add your email? Sure. Um, I'm also going to add my WeChat since we've spoken so much about WeChat today. I'm going to give you my WeChat ID as well in case you'd like to add me in WeChat. Um, so that's the end. And again, um, that's the end of session three. Tomorrow's session four. If you haven't registered for it, go to woodburnglobal.com slash, slash events. Um, and I hope to see all of you again tomorrow. Take care and, uh, and goodbye. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.